gostam, particularmente diante de questões complexas, caracterizadas por incerteza, controvérsia, ambiguidade, que é exatamente essas questões que permeiam essa interface, isso é muito mais complexo. Né? É, eu trago aqui né, uma reflexão para a gente pensar a partir de uma análise que nós fizemos, que mostra que... É, a seleção das evidências científicas que estão disponíveis né, para a formulação de políticas, ela não é muito equilibrada, né, longe disso. Né. Em geral, são reforçadas e ganham projeção as evidências que apoiam posições políticas que muitas vezes já foram tomadas. Né. Numa análise que nós fizemos recentemente, conduzida principalmente por um pesquisador, colega meu da Universidade de Campinas, o José Eduardo Viglio, a gente analisou as diferentes narrativas científicas sobre a questão do petróleo, particularmente do pré-sal, no contexto de mudança climática aqui no Brasil. E o que a gente observou é que, apesar de um forte consenso entre os cientistas brasileiros sobre as mudanças climáticas e as suas causas humanas, né, as suas interpretações, expectativas e proposições em relação né, ao papel do petróleo no contexto das mudanças climáticas foram muito distintas. Né? E quando a gente tentou olhar que narrativas prevalecem e que fortalecem as posições do governo que vêm sendo tomadas, né, ou vinham sendo tomadas de aproveitar esse momento de exploração do petróleo, fica muito evidente que algumas dessas narrativas mais alinhadas com essas decisões é as que ganharam reverberação. Né? E, por fim, eu destaco um último desafio, que eu acho que a gente precisa ter clareza, né, que nesse momento, nessa dobra do século XX para o XXI, né, a ciência ela é, ela tende a ser mais valorizada em termos de impacto da sua produção na sociedade, em termos de impacto da, da produção no sistema produtivo, do que propriamente pelo avanço do conhecimento. E isso nos coloca, enquanto pesquisadores, né, numa situação também de uh, bastante, uh, eu não diria fragilidade, mas uh, de sensibilidade. Né? Afinal de contas, a gente precisa ter clareza né, que há, sim, uma distinção entre informação útil e informação que realmente é útil para o processo decisório, não é aquilo que só é útil para a ciência. Né? Mas, particularmente, a gente precisa entender que não basta a informação estar disponível para ela ser usada no processo decisório. Né? Depende muito da própria percepção né, que os tomadores de decisão têm em relação a essa informação disponibilizada, de como esses conhecimentos se articulam com o conhecimento que já está consolidado, disseminado principalmente. Né? Mas mais do que isso, depende da interação entre aqueles que produzem ciência e aqueles que usam o conhecimento científico para a tomada de decisão. E aí, para fechar a minha fala, nesse último minuto, eu chamo a atenção para essa perspectiva de coprodução de conhecimento e de redes de atores colaborativas, né? o que, na língua inglesa, a gente vem chamando de co-production of science and technology, e principalmente de boundary of organizations, né? aquelas organizações que atuam numa perspectiva de fronteira. Né? Acho que a coprodução, e nessa perspectiva, o que eu estou entendendo enquanto coprodução, né, é uma forma de interação mesmo, particularmente nessa interação entre ciência e política, né, entre uh, diferentes atores, aqueles que produzem ciência, conhecimento, aqueles que demandam esse conhecimento, aqueles que mediam o conhecimento, para facilitar, principalmente, o uso no processo decisório. É óbvio que esse processo não é fácil, ele precisa de muita negociação entre as partes envolvidas, né? precisa ter ali um consenso entre os benefícios, né? mas eu acho que esse é o caminho mais apropriado se, de fato, a gente quer ampliar né, o uso de evidências, de informações científicas para garantir processos decisórios que estejam mais alinhados né, à questão da sustentabilidade, à questão dos objetivos do desenvolvimento sustentável. Eu termino a minha fala aqui agradecendo mais uma vez o convite. Esse era só uma introdução dos, desses desafios né, que têm sido pensados também no âmbito da pesquisa. Estou bastante curiosa para escutar os meus colegas e aí a gente fazer o debate. Obrigada mais uma vez. Yes, yes, thank you very much, Gabriela. And I forgot to say, I should have said, Gabriela is the assistant professor at the university, or an assistant professor at the University of Sao Paulo. Yeah. So our second speaker is Harsha Dyer, 
who, is, who currently works as Director of Research in the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation. That's a long one. <laughs> when the Presidency of South Africa. Yeah, that's right. So, thank you. Good morning. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having this um, uh, great symposium put together by the organisers and the opportunity to participate. I think I've been quite uh, excited about all the deliberations over the last uh, two days. I am going to come from a perspective of the policy space. So thank you for the invitation and for the inclusion. Just to um, do my declaration, but also to give you a quick outline of uh, the presentation. Um, really to give you a bit of a glimpse, and I think in 12 minutes it's gonna be just a glimpse, and I apologize in advance for some of the slides that I'm gonna quickly whiz past because I have a lot to share. Uh, the types of qualitative evidence in policy, and uh, really a collaborative model that we, and I've been asked to sp speak specifically about this, a col collaborative model we are going to share from South Africa between um, uh, academia and government. And then some of the key lessons between uh, f learning from the social sciences which impact on qualitative evidence and some thoughts taking forward. So let's put the demand side in context from our perspective. Um, I think that if I just draw from, from South Africa's experience, but I know that this is quite a, uh, quite a trend in lots of the different countries, we are um, let me just see if this works, yeah. We are able to project and plan in a horizon, so we're doing long-term planning, and um, this is a bit of a new situation for South Africa where we take year, uh, very high-level national reviews, and um, the blueprint of the country is the National Development Plan. Now, why I mention this is, why I mention this is that you know, we have a system of the sectoral plans and the delivery agreements by departments, and this is where different sectors have to come together. And as a country, we, are, we have a very specific structure and a framework, or the me medium-term strategic framework, that is linked to the National Development Plan. Now, for us, this is, not, this is a new experience. Just to draw from another evidence synthesis report that we've We've, we've, we've using for quite a lot of our, our um, um, analysis is that a uh, um, study done from Manchester University actually of 107 other national development plans done across countries. There's a trend or a comeback of more countries from the south to engage with national development plans as a strategy to, to meet developmental objectives. Just by comparison, South Africa just recently did it um, Brazil has a national development planning for the past 60 years. And why this is really critical is to say that the policy agenda setting is really now for us in terms of the coordination and the national development plan visionary goals uh, is the place where all sectoral plans, this is including right across the social, economic, uh, political plans that, that need to find expression in our developmental objectives. But we also have a Africa agenda, so it's a regional plan where most of the interdependencies between the regions, and then comes our uh, reporting to the SDGs. So what is important is that a lot of our research community, our researchers, our academics, are beginning to map the research that they do to the SDGs and aligned to the National Development Plan. And this is reflected in our very recent report that we've just um, presented at the United Nations, where a lot of the sectoral inputs come together. Now, why this is important, and I think that uh, I want to highlight this complexity um, and bringing it down to what types of evidence we use in the policy space, which kind of stretches our minds to beyond primary studies and qualitative methods. So I think everybody is aware of evaluation evidence, and I think we've been speaking in the past two days about um, policy evaluations and what, what uh, policies actually work. We have a whole body of work in DPME where evaluation evidence is brought into the picture. 
a lot of the last two days on citizens-based evidence, but it's really about the trust in government, the trust that we have in terms of service delivery, that development of objectives, and then progressive, uh, progressive uh, uh, policies are able to be realized and felt by the citizens. This is a lot of the panels have been engaging with this. We know that the media plays a critical role in, in, in interpreting what is happening in the ground, on the ground and in terms of the, the kind of uh, social issues that get taken up. I mentioned the, the, the NDP. Really, the opposition parties, what policies are put forward by the opposition parties, this is, this is what we, we need to tackle because of the, the kind of tussle that happens within government. The sectoral mandates and the policies and programs that get um, as a result of certain sectoral policies that strategies might, might not be coherent with other strategies of other departments. And then here comes the academic and the scientific evidence. So you can see that not only one type of evidence is gets, gets um, uh, considered into the, the process, but what is the implications then? It's not just about demand for evidence synthesis. It's really evidence synthesis a necessary uh, strategy to go forward. Um, so I think if you can just appreciate that working in this space, we had to find some way of actually synthesizing this evidence, especially that qualitative plays such a big part of our our day-to-day -day work. We did find some way that we had to make sense of all this. So we adopted the systematic review methodology to make this pathway of evidence going into the policy making process more scientific, more systematic, and more transparent. So we adopted this. I don't have the time to engage with this, but this had led to a very, um, a, a very workable co-production model. It, it has six parts to the co-production model. Um, we have a session this afternoon which I will elaborate on, but there's a, there's a clear matchmaking process between experts in government and experts in academia very much an, an embedded engagement within the processes of, of government and policy making. Managing the many mandates. So you'll hear the government departments talking about their mandates very separately. But what we do is we have a project management office on the mandates. Um, supporting policy champions and building networks. That's a very big part of our work. We, we find that there is a high demand for evidence. But when there isn't that pathway that we can bring evidence into it, you're going to lose your policy champions that actually are demanding the evidence. We put a lot of emphasis on good governance, which is the, the voices and the different, um, the different narratives that comes from between government, business, private sector, um, the unions, all of them. Uh, a, big, a big shift is happening in our commissioning processes because um, traditional ways of of uh, engaging with academics through contracted or commissioned work is not working. But um, I don't have much time to, to get into that, just to say that arising out of, th this was very much a um, five year period of applying, and I'll show you how we've applied this approach to a co-production model, and where does it all fit in into our collaborative approach? At our core value, is our evidence-informed decision and policy making. I think this is what brings us all together, is how do we put evidence into the policy cycle? And if I just zoom into that, we have a very clear, um, it, it looks neat, at least it's not a linear model, but agenda setting, planning, monitoring, and evaluation. And from diagnosing to planning to output uh, and, and outcome and impact, you can see the different types of evidence in entering into the policy cycle. It can happen at any time, but it's a different types. And I think this is what we use to, to build consensus, and that's our core value system. But in terms of methodology, I mentioned about uh, evidence synthesis, because that's the research, the policy relevant, re relevant research methodology that we adopt. Um, amongst other evidence synthesis methodologies, we are doing mapping. And this is just a bit of an example of our mapping tool. Um, I don't have time to go into this, but just to show that that is what we use. Um, our activities and processes in terms of our delivery mechanisms is very much a co-production model. And we are, this is our 
our role at the moment, a knowledge brokering and rapid response service. Um, and we're building capacity in ways that I want to share with you. Um, I'll share with you just in a while. So the collaborative model in practice, what we have done is we built evidence maps. So we have an evidence map in human settlements, in a capable and developmental state, which is very much part of our National Development Plan chapter, uh, a, a very critical area of early grade mathematics study. Spatial transformation, this is a high agenda item for linked to land reform. And what you can see is, is a process of us building an evidence base. And this is what we start to use. Our clients in these mapping processes are the Deputy Director General, which is just one below the Director General, but in terms of the developmental state was the National Planning Commission. This was a line function department. These were sp spatial planning experts. They want wanted us to put all of this together. And then this was a presidential panel. So what, what we find is that there's a core set of disciplines, core set of disciplines across these sectors. Um, and and what, what country comparisons we have is where we are interested in the geographical spread of our, our policies. So I just want to um, draw from our experience of translating all of this into social sciences. I think that, um, in fact, Gabri Gabriella spoke a lot about this part of, of, of systems of uh, indigenous and knowledge systems in terms of citizens' understanding of science. And I think you are all familiar with scientific knowledge uh, produced by universities, but there's a whole body of work and knowledge that's generated by government decision-making and policy processes. And that's through this, this um, uh, agenda cycle that, and that policy cycle that I mentioned. So how do we all, because there's these different systems of knowledge generation, how do we actually work together? That's, that's for me the question, because we can have this relationship, you can have the science society relationship, government is very much interested in what uh, local communities are doing, but can, this kind of uh, uh, collaboration include all these systems of science. Just to quickly then go through some of the thoughts on taking the work forward. I think I've highlighted very briefly that the SDGs can only be realized if the context within which they will be implemented is considered. This sounds simple. It sounds too um, common to know that this is, this is what should be done. But the SDGs need to be aligned to NDPs or if there isn't NDPs, what is the country level developmental agendas? Because really you're going to be drawing from that uh, knowledge base to be able to report even at a country level. Um, I think from our perspective, we're finding that we need to clarify and strengthen the role of social sciences or councils in evidence synthesis, and especially for countries of the South. Um, the kind of uh, evidence synthesis methodologies we are wanting to ask whether are there capacity constraints within the social sciences or are there institutional stumbling blocks. Uh, personally, I feel it's the latter, but I, I can, I can, you can debate with me and discuss it later on. Um, I think the balance between evidence, uh, the independence and legitis legitimacy is, is for me a, 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 a not an, an, an a known fact because I think that I'm not sure if many people yes feel that, but working with the demand side partners does not mean a compromise on independence. It really does question how your research process stays independent. But for us, the legitimacy of the, the, the uh, evidence that you generate is a critical one. So just with those thoughts, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Harsha. Very clear. And thank you again for finishing on time. This is wonderful. I'm incredibly impressed. So there's a, there's a <laughs> you have to follow on now, Lorenz. So Lorenz Langer is our next speaker, senior researcher at the University of Johannesburg, Johanna, Johannesburg's Africa Center for Evidence, the ACE Center. So. Super. Thanks so much. Um, so it's a co-produced presentation, seeing that we had, we talk about co-production here. So I hope if Harsha had like a minute left that I can add those to, to my um, input. So yeah, so I'm, I'm Lawrence from ACE, and I want to talk with you a little bit about the research side of the lovely work that Hersha has just presented to you. And you see in my title that it looks very much like Hersha's outline, with just this little 
tick on it. So I'm talking about prioritizing demand side evidence needs. So I would actually go one step further than Hersha has in her presentation, not just responding to demand side evidence needs, but to prioritize them. And so I'll bring in the research perspective, uh, particularly from what we've learned in practice of doing this work. So it's not so much theoretical or conceptual. It's really a reflection on um, what our team as researchers, being embedded in a government-led policy um, co-production approach, has learned. So a very quick caveat. Um, so there's no particular conflict of interests here. Um, what I have to say is those the lessons and reflections that I'll be giving you, they are really based on work in the social sciences, outside health, and also of work based in South Africa. So um, keep that in mind. Um, so I'm not making any particular claims that this is equally relevant outside South Africa. Um, so I'm speaking from this context. And the five high level lessons that I'll give you are really that. They're high level, um, they're not exhaustive. A bit slower, okay, never mind. So, yeah, so these lessons uh, are really high level and they're not necessarily exhaustive. So, just to pick up where Hersha has left off. So, she's given you these two, oh, these two lovely slides, which are really the core of the model that she and her team in DPME has produced. So, it is an essential in an approach how to do co-production led by a government department. And so, if you hear me talking about the model, um, keep in mind that that's what I'm referring to. It is these seven steps you see on the left of how you engage an evidence synthesis. It's these six steps on the right about the mechanisms of how do you co-produce. So uh, the team from ACE, um, where I'm based, we've been embedded in these processes for four years, and that's what we're reflecting on, being kind of planted in this government ministry who's leading this really innovative work around evidence synthesis and evidence use and being part of that. So this is what we're reflecting on. So, and Hersha's team, it's, it's, it's really lovely people, but they're also sometimes really modest. So, just in case you have not quite gotten it from her presentation, because it might have been implicit rather than explicit, there's actually a lot of really special things happening in that government-led co-production approach of DPME. And particularly if you're coming from an academic perspective and you're familiar with the literature on co-production, I just wanted to give you three thoughts which I think are different and special about the work that Hersha's team in DPME does. So the first one is that this is a co-production model developed by a government agency. Oftentimes, our co-production approaches, they start in academia. They start with a researcher responding to a, a research proposal and outlining an idea about co-production. So they might start with a theoretical paper written by a researcher on what co-production should be. This is different. This is a government department deciding that they want to use co-production to make evidence more relevant to decision makers' needs. They decided they want co-production. They have decided they're putting up the funding for co-production. So it's a slightly different starting point to develop that model. And there's, there's lots of interesting uh, entities and cross references that the, the levels on which this co-production applies. Um, it's interprofessional. So in all the projects that they're leading, you have different types of professions coming together in co-production. Civil servants, researchers, IT professionals, Likewise, it's interdisciplinary. You have on the same team economists, teachers, methodologists, so it's, it's, it's quite diverse. Likewise, it's intersectoral. We have housing people, education people. So you're not just co-producing around one dimension. You're not just bridging one particular uh, professional divide. You're bridging quite a few. The second thing that I think is special about it is that as much as there's an overall model led by a government approach, each individual project within this co-production model is then also commissioned and led by civil servants. So you have a model and then you applying it in different government departments on specific policy issues and each of these projects is commissioned by government and led by a government uh, official. And that then immediately puts the evidence users needs and context to shape and drive the project. So it's not me as a researcher writing my research proposal and saying how I want to use co-production and then I'm bringing somebody on board from a practice or policy context. It is embedded in what the decision maker think co-production should be. And then the last special thing I just mentioned quickly is, um, slow, okay. The last uh, special thing to mention is around that the, the model allows for both once off production of evidence synthesis and for long-term knowledge management. So you have often very rapid evidence needs in a government department, and this model allows you to very quickly come together and respond to this need in a three-day synthesis, a 10-day synthesis. But at the same time, the model also allows you 
to have strategic knowledge management and translation in a government department to develop responsive evidence bases going forwards. So it's kind of this ad hoc, really frantic evidence use and the more long-term strategic one. So that's what I would offer to you is quite special about the work that Hersha's team is leading. So then what have we learned as researchers? Um, and this is partly talking to fellow researchers in the audience. The first one is there seems to be sometimes an assumption on researchers that there's a deficit model in a policy context. And I think this deficit model actually has its own deficit. So we, in this project where we worked together over the last four years, often we've observed researchers taking a position where they're deliberately thinking they should be contra contrarian to civil servants. It's almost like researchers thought, well, we're coming to a government department and it's really us who are speaking on behalf of the people or the marginalized. These policy people, they just care about average outcomes on a national level. They don't quite understand the needs of the population on the ground. And that kind of came often together with a, with a stance, almost that being critical of what the policy colleagues were offering, that that's a virtue, that that is my default position as a researcher, that I'm here to kind of protect the interest of the people against the policy colleagues. So we found that quite interesting to observe. The second point is around if we go into a co-production approach, who has the technical expertise and who's a custodian of rigor? And oftentimes we found researchers assuming that that is their role in the project, which is a bit curious because if you think that you're doing a synthesis in a policy context that might go all the way to cabinet level, the professional risk and the scrutiny that goes into a cabinet document compared to me submitting a journal article to a, to a peer-reviewed paper, it's not quite the same. Actually, the risks are much larger for the policy colleagues. The worst thing that can happen to me is a rejection. The worst thing that can go wrong if you submit something to cabinet and it's not quite up to standard. There's a much larger professional risk here. The third point was around how researchers assumed that their professional norms are almost protected or something sacred. So I have a colleague whose email signature says something like, um, I, I love the whooshing sounds that deadlines make when they fly past. And well, that's, that's quite difficult if you work in a policy context because the, the deadlines are public sector deadlines and if it's not done on time, there's repercussions. Citizens are not getting their services. So there was an assumption that we as researchers don't have to change our professional norms. So we found this quite interesting to observe across the different projects and I would just maybe offer some counter thoughts to these default positions of researchers that we often saw. It's, maybe think around that policymakers often have an activist background too. It's not necessarily that they're just technical people or technocrats, so to speak. Maybe let's think around that policymakers might understand the political and economic realities, so the scope and the space for policy change, much better than ourselves as researchers. And that policymakers are under equal pressure to deliver high quality work in very, very short time frames um, with non-flexible deadlines. And then who has a public mandate to speak on behalf of the people? Is it unelected researchers or is it civil servants who've been put into positions by a democratically elected government? I think it's an important question to think about. The second point, the second lesson that we ob observed in, in our co-production model is that interactions and capacities need to be managed. And that can together with sometimes an assumption our research community in South Africa where co-production is this romantic ideal. It's almost like a value in itself. Co-producing is great. We're coming together, everybody's participating, and we're in one room and we'll become friends and it's, it's going to be great. We're going to have fun and the evidence is going to be much more relevant. Across a number of projects, we've learned that that is actually rarely ever the place uh, um, in, in practice. Uh, people have different egos, different people have different approaches, different soft skills, different hard skills, and it's quite difficult to get them to genuinely co-produce. And so it's crucial what Hersha showed you from a model of the six steps that you actively manage co-production. And even in a situation where the team might not naturally be able to co-produce through the model that Hersha's team has developed, you can almost engineer this co-production approach. Um, and it's as much as co-production is messy and non-linear, you can have the, uh, a technical and scientific process to put a structure towards it. So it's moving a little bit away from this romantic ideal of co-production. The third point, and now that's picking a bit more on our, our public sector colleagues, is around the procurement structures in the public sector. 
they make it, at least in South Africa, really difficult to genuinely co-produce in the long term. Co-production works well if you have relationships that are developing over a number of projects, over a number of years. But what happens if you have a system in which recurring contracts to the same research organization flex, is flagged for corruption constantly? So it makes it really difficult for us to keep engaged, to keep working, because now it looks like we have a cozy relationship. We're too close to the government partners. And it sometimes comes from this, the setup of the current system for procurement is for a consultancy culture. It assumes a government department wants to commission a piece of research, it puts out a tender, the researcher applies for it, gets the tender, goes away, comes back a month later to uh, deliver the research report. And obviously that's not how co-production co works, but that's really what we have often observed in practice, that we have government colleagues who assume that we're going to go away, that my team as researchers, we're coming for the first meeting and I say, okay, we understand this, we take our brief, and then you hear from us in three months. And they were really surprised when we kept engaging, when Hersha's model basically forced them to come every week and speak to us and engage. Um, so we ran into these embedded um, consultancy cultures quite a bit in, in our work. The fourth lesson, coming back to academics, it's really around the, the, the incentives. I think for most of you based at the university, you would know the pressure to publish, particularly in South Africa. Often it's the pressure to publish and the pressure to bring in third-party funding. And that's kind of how you evaluate it within your organizational context. And so if you do co-production, you're probably not going to do either. Co-production really, um, no, you're only getting half of the money, so to speak, because the project is split between two, the team you're co-producing with. So your dean is not going to be happy with the half the money you're bringing when you, he wanted the full money. Likewise, you're not really publishing much, in particular if you're working in a government department co-production approach where the output is a policy document. So your incentives are not quite aligned. Um, and we've learned that it's actually quite important to market the policy access. So what gets our executive in the university excited is that we can speak to the presidency, that we can say the high level briefing by the president, we informed that. So some in the university, individuals get really excited about that. And that is important to nurture these and act actively be proactive about it because then you're getting the space from your dean to allow you to co-produce. She's not going to be on your back con constantly about publications if she knows okay, no, that team actually does really high profile work that increases the standing of the university. And yeah, so just reframing the incentives in, in that sense. And then my last lesson is just to reflect quickly on the danger of a single study as much as the danger of a single type of a study. So for us, it's curious um, that in we, we're sending a message to decision makers in South Africa that you shouldn't use a single study or a report, that you should use synthesis. But equally so, we're not sending a message where you should use a single type of evidence either. We, we're not saying just use RCTs or just use qualitative evidence. And it's almost a, a non-discussion, to be honest. It's something that we never had to talk about because in the policy request for evidence, as I think you've heard in earlier plenaries, you, you need all types of evidence for any policy decision. It's, it's rarely ever that you can use a single type for a single policy decision. So it's come natural to have qualitative, quantitative, government-led research, academic-led research. And so it's interesting sometimes that we engage with academics who want to push a particular type of evidence, assuming you know, one type can conquer it all, when our reality is that you actually, for policy context, it's a discussion that's not usually um, taking place. So my last slide is then just on what I would say about going forward. And I think it's around thinking a little bit how we drive and who's in control and the power about core production. So as much as co-production sounds like an equal pay playing field, I mean, after all, there's a co in there, it does differ where it starts. If co-production starts with a research proposal, with the idea being in a researcher's mind, with a research council putting up the funding for it, you will not get these inherent power dynamics out of it. As much as you then go and you generally have good intentions, you co-produce, it did start from a research setting. And if we're serious about having a co-production approach that makes evidence more relevant to evidence users, my argument would be we should have start with the evidence user herself. And that would then advocate for a decision-maker-driven co-production approach as DPME has pioneered. And that's why I would argue for prioritizing evidence needs, not just responding to them. And just imagine for a second a situation in which government departments across the world 
leading on co-production, where we have 20 governments coming together, all reflecting on how they've co-produced, what they've learned when they were in control of initiating co-production. I think we would be much further with our practical lessons on how to do this well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. And that was, it was a great segue between the two presentations to take that argument forward. So we finished with Teresa Jones, who is senior associate with Anthrologica, and she will be telling you what Anthrologica is and what it means <laughs> in practice. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Teresa Jones. I work with Anthrologica. We are a research-based organization specializing in applied anthropology and applied social science in global health. We're also founding partners of the Social Science in Humanitarian Action Platform. So I will be talking today on the use of qualitative evidence to prepare for and respond to public health emergencies. So I'm going to start with this slide from the NIH which shows us the number of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases in the world right now. Now, I don't know your reaction to this slide, but for me, to be honest, it is quite overwhelming. So with the scale of the issue in mind, the push to move the response to public health emergencies away from purely valuing biomedical and epidemiological knowledge to also acknowledging context and incorporating social, cultural, and political knowledge is not new, but it was escalated as a result of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And it has since gained some traction in responses to yellow fever, to Zika, and also to cholera. There's better recognition now that in order to successfully prepare for detect and respond to health emergencies, work must be grounded in local knowledge and expertise, local resources, and it must be built on local action. However, there's a lot of space to improve, especially when it comes to mechanisms for learning, mechanisms for changing the trajectory of a health response in light of what it has learned, and also more room for joint action, and as much as possible, for communities who are infected, affected by uh, infectious diseases to be able to take the lead themselves. So how can we use qualitative evidence in these sorts of contexts? So I will be sharing with you some of our experiences and some of the things that we've learned in a, almost as a phased approach. So when an outbreak is declared, what can we do in the immediate aftermath? Well, we can mobilize existing knowledge. We do not work in a vacuum very rarely. That existing knowledge can be on the context, so the people groups, livelihoods, languages, on key themes, key topics that we can predict will be important in a health emergency. For example, health beliefs, health-seeking behaviors, and so on. And also on emerging issues. So if that health response might be introducing new vaccines and new therapeutics, how have these been responded to in the past? This mobilization can be action-oriented, present key considerations that can help shape the health response strategy and can be used across different sectors of the emergency response. We can create networks of local, national, and international experts who can bring in critical insights they can be experts on geographical areas or on topic areas. And we can also support the development of tools that might be rolled out as we come to real-time evidence generation. So social scientists can be deployed or activated as part of emergency response teams. Ideally, these are local national researchers who can highlight emerging issues on the ground. For example, where certain communication materials around preventative behaviors are falling short. They can undertake rapid research in the field. This might be formative research, but also operational research, because we need to understand the humanitarian architecture as well. They can be training others in research methodologies and in how to use this sort of research. Findings can be meshed with that existing knowledge, and large data sets can be supported externally, 
with people that might have a bit more time on their hands. And this is really important. Qualitative data collection allows us to open up two-way communication channels and feedback loops, which are really important in an evolving humanitarian crisis, especially where trust might be fragile. And then, of course, the longer-term research agenda, which should be addressing gaps in the existing data. It can take a deeper focus on some of these emerging issues, especially issues that require more rigorous and more longitudinal information. For example, how do people adapt their behavior in light of response initiatives over time? So I wanted to highlight just two key considerations in this work. There are very many. The first one being around thinking operationally. Hopefully, most of us can agree that qualitative evidence can provide really crucial insights to inform humanitarian response. But where we fall short is turning that, those findings into action. So why is it so difficult? <laughs> what are some of the challenges that we face? Well, we would argue that bringing the world of social science into the world of public health response can introduce a number of conflicts. So the left side will be the world of the public health response and the right side, the world of social science. Of course, these are extreme ends, but they're interesting to think about. So health emergencies are really interested in standardization. You are drowning in standard operating procedures in an outbreak situation. Whereas, as social scientists, we're interested in contextualization. Outbreak response in a more biomedical framework is more problem-centered. So the problem being the disease and the aftermath of the disease. Whereas, as social scientists, we're more people-centered. The emergency time frame of a humanitarian response is very real. Decisions need to be made here and now. Not always, but very often, decision makers are compelled to make very quick decisions. But as social scientists, we work in a much more longer term research process. So how can we adapt that to be more feasible in these sorts of contexts? And then finally, the operational versus the academic. As social scientists, we bring a lot of thought and rigor to our work. We're very concerned with understanding what is, whereas humanitarian responders, by definition, are interested in action and doing. So to be able to translate the theoretical and the complex into the tangible and actionable can be a challenge. Just to credit Fernanda Falero from WHO and previously MSF for this framework, but we also believe there's a lot of area for complementarity in this, and there's a lot of kind of middle ground that we can work towards. So what have we learned in terms of operationalizing data? And I'm very sorry for the very wordy slide. But what decision makers want is high quality information products that are relevant to the situation under consideration. So if we're working in this setting, we need to be listening for information priorities from a range of stakeholders. And in this case, social science might be better embedded into decision making teams. We can help colleagues identify the sorts of information that they need. For example, if we know that certain vaccinations are not going down well, we can help colleagues think about that maybe some of their questions might be around how do people experience the vaccination service. We should take raw data, analyze it, transform it, and compile it with other relevant data. In this sort of context, epidemiological data is really important to be compiling this sort of information with. So that would show us the sort of the journey of the outbreak. We should be transforming this information into a concrete format that can help analysis, decision making, and action. As best as possible in real time. We should be pulling the so what from the results and making concrete recommendations that match the resources available, which are not always very many which involves clarifying who are these recommendations for, what is the time frame, and how can they be monitored. And this should be happening across the response cycle and across sectors as well. Which leads me to the second key consideration, which is around cross-sectoral working. So health emergencies are naturally multi-sectoral. This diagram here is the cluster system, 
which might, not always, but it might be activated in a humanitarian emergency. And we see here the number of different sectors that might be involved, so health, nutrition, protection, and so on. And perhaps we can agree that qualitative evidence can be useful across these. And certainly to change the trajectory of a response requires change across multiple sectors. However, the humanitarian architecture is against us in this case. So this on the right is from the Joint External Evaluation, which is an instrument of the legally binding international health regulations. And I've circled risk communications here, which community engagement sits in here, and social science sits in community engagement. Whereas we would argue that social science should be embedded across the strategy of a response so that qualitative evidence can be operationalized across that strategy. There has been a bit more movement, so the JEE has recognized that we need to be pulling this sort of knowledge and influence across, across the board. So I started off talking about the Social Science in Humanitarian Action Platform, which was founded by IDS, so in Sussex, uh, Anthrologica, and also UNICEF provided the seed funding. And that was founded to make better use of social science evidence, to enable more effective responses, which are not context blind, to build local capacity and in institutions in this sense, and to enhance learnings from previous emergencies. We tend to forget that there's ever been another emergency. A bit of a snapshot of some of the work that we've been doing right now in uh, North Kivu, in DRC, where there's currently an Ebola outbreak, which started in August last year. We've helped to establish a number of networks and advisory groups. So as I mentioned, these are local, national, and international experts on certain geographical areas or topic areas. We've helped develop a number of operational briefs. Now, these are all open source. They're in English and in French. I think we have about 17 so far. You might not be able to read, but we have one on burial practices, one on cross-border dynamics with, DRC, uh, with Uganda DRC. And these are really based around topics of operational priority. They're formed meshing together existing knowledge with data that's collected in the field and also insights from these expert networks. Um, and you'll see here on the end, which uh, one saying data, compila uh, data compilation. So, oh, let me go back. So data synthesis is another activity that we've been doing which brings together all of the social science research that's been happening for the last three months in country so that decision makers can have that in one place. We're providing a number of different types of technical assistance, uh, remote analysis of big data sets, and also advocacy in many different formats. So with my last point two <laughs> minutes, I, will, I, I was asked to talk about preparedness um, which is a very big topic, gets people very excited in the world of public health emergency. So preparing for the next big outbreak and so on. So much of this discussion is around pre-positioning drugs and supplies. Whereas we would argue that we can be prepared from a social science standpoint as well. So how can we do this? We can think about pre-positioning some of that existing data that we think will be important pre-positioning networks who can rapidly feed in their insights if and when an outbreak happens. We can build capacity for social science at local and national levels, and importantly, within the different sectors of an emergency response as well. And we can also support the creation of pools of social scientists who really understand the sort of emergency architecture that might be uh, activated, who can be ready to work. So um, I'm happy to talk a bit more about some of these specific activities, but for now, I will thank you all for listening and for the conveners for inviting me to speak today. Thank you very much. That's fabulous. And I have to say thank you to all four speakers for keeping to time. So we now have oceans of time for conversations and, and questions. And 
So on, and I would just observe that I think there's been a nice story arc, really, between the four presenters, between the, the kind of fundamental theoretical space in, in which you started talking, Gabriella, and, and then into the kind of policy, the government arena, and then into the what happens in the field. So I think that's been, if we ever put this session together, a really nice story arc. So thank you very much. Um, general questions, also maybe some specific questions about the precise objective here, which, is a, which this session has, which is how we work together across sectors to create really good quality evidence. And also maybe, as I observed it from the four speakers, the two notions of co-production and trust. And they all talked about those two notions. So that might also be something else for you to talk about. So those or any other questions or comments in the room or online, we're, we're open for business. Yeah. You got a roving mic? Uh, my name is Leonor Pacheco, my, and I work at the University of Brasilia, um, so very closely with the Fiocruz Brasilia. My question, well, first, the excellent presentations, and I would especially congratulate Teresa for her English lesson that she gave us. It was an excellent pronunciation and very slowly so excellent presentation. The question I would like to ask to anybody in the panel is, what about a conflict of interest? Because uh, our university, I was the coordinator of post-graduation at my university in public health. And I would say 70% of our students are public servants coming from ministry, secretaries of health, et cetera. And when it's, a when it's one of my students, I advise them not to analyze their own policy because I, I believe it's very difficult for them to separate. But other professors don't do this. And sometimes we end up with a dissertation or PhD thesis where we can, we can see that the author did not want to criticize very things that points that should be criticized. So how do we go about this? It's excellent. I think co-production is the way to go. But how do we deal with these conflicts of interest? Good morning. Well, we can have some questions, or let's, let's have two or three then, and then we'll come back. So just so we don't forget, that's all. <laughs> okay, next question. Good morning. Uh, my name is Aruna, and I'm coming from India. I have a very uh, generic question, and um, you can call it a naive question. Um, I need to understand the difference between co-production and collaboration. When you're talking about policy making, we oftentimes um, collaborate across departments, across uh, sectors. Uh, so maybe um, this question is not direct to anybody uh, that, uh, particularly, but uh, just to hear from your panel. Thank you. Okay, should we have we got anybody else just now or should we respond to those two? So let's respond to those two. So it's three C's. Conflict, collaboration, what was the one? Co-production. Yeah. Who wants to pick it up? Uh, thanks so much. I think the conflict of interest question was really good. Um, I think it's something we, that comes across our work in, in different ways. So I think I'd have two answers depending on the particular situation that you find yourself in. So I think if it's an institutional project um, where it's a formal evaluation of a policy or policy intervention, I would agree that it's really difficult for the policymaker herself to lead on the evaluation. So South Africa has a national evaluation system. And the current approach in there is to outsource the evaluation to an uh, independent body. And partly because it's institutional, it will be published afterwards, it will go to cabinet, and the conflict seems to be too large. Even though government often has the technical ability to some extent to lead on these evaluations, just for the sake of civil society trusting the evaluation, it has to be done by an independent body. So my first answer then would be if it's in an institutional formal context, I think the independence needs to be maintained. However, if I were to respond to a context a bit more where somebody is studying their own policy for a PhD or for, for a master's, I think I would give a slightly different response. Um, because if somebody not in policy comes to me and asks for a PhD topic, 
I actually would advise her to choose a topic that she is embedded in. And so I wouldn't advise my policy colleague when Hersha would come to do a PhD to study a policy that one of her colleagues has led on and not herself because there's so much localized and um, think protected knowledge that she has of the particular policy that for I think a formal PhD or master's I, I wouldn't see the conflict of interest and it's almost a bit like well, if you're coming more from a critical theory perspective you are embedded in the situation which actually brings out particular knowledges that nobody else has so I would I know it's a bit cheeky for me to separate the two but I hope it gives a bit of a thinking other thoughts on the conflict? Yeah. Okay, now I'm speaking English because it's easier. I guess so, and I hope so. Uh, so, Leonor, I totally agree with you, but I think that the big challenge when we have students in our postgrad programs that they have uh, professional experiences related to their or issues is to um, help them to understand that this is a process of learning. So their experiences are really important and most of the time uh, uh, they can bring these experiences to better analyze in, in a theoretical context with our frameworks. But at the same time, they need to be, pe be prepared for this, you know, to, to, to understand that during their master or PhD times, they are students. They are producing knowledge. Uh, they have to be critical with their propositions, with their experiences, with their uh, things that they bring to the university to think better or to improve the public policies or their actions. It's a big challenge. It's not easy. In my case, uh, I be part of a professional master at the University of Sao Paulo. So most of my students work in a city hall or in different departments or in different public institutions. And most of the cases, they bring their specific issues to think about, to uh, improve their actions, their interventions at the university. And I needed to respect this. And they also needed to learn how to think as research. And in terms of the second question, the difference between co-production and collaboration, I think that uh, the main idea of co-production is defining together the issue. Is defining together, and when I say together, I'm thinking about researchers, uh, practitioners, um, civil servants um, or s local stakeholders, but it, that's the challenge, define it together and also respect the different uh, ways of knowledge. So the scientific knowledge, the local knowledge, the traditional knowledge, this is very different of collaboration. I think that f from my perspective, this is the, the basis of the co-production. Thank you. I think those, this, the first question, I'm not going to be able to do it from the perspective of the academics, but as a public servant, I think that the conflict of interest in terms of it having a very fine line with ethics and ethical considerations, it really depends in bringing, pick, picking up from what um, both uh, Gabriela and Lawrence has said, I really I think the objective, if it's for learning, public servants need to learn that their objectivity matters here in terms of oversight and accountability rather than um, having some kind of fear of the kind of information that they're going to present. So is the objective using that, that study or the finding or whether it's a learning one? I think the question of independence is quite a critical one. And I think if academics teaching public servants to keep this objectivity, you're actually contributing to this depoliticizing the, the public service. Because I think that is the other problem of the administration versus the poli political side. Um, and public servants not being 
loyal to certain policies only, but to be highly critical where criticism is necessary for what works in, 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 in the kind of context we are looking for. So I think for, for your longer term vision to contribute to public servants that are professional, to be able to criticize and to be able to analyze, that, that's, that's a critical one. Um, I think for me the difference between co-production and collaboration, it's hinging between collaboration deals with uh, the, the kind of relationship you build. You're still exploring where are we collaborating. It's, it's, a, it's a relationship that's exploratory still. But in terms of co-production, you're bringing the entire value chain. And the entire value chain has multiple collaborative relationships within that at e every level of the value chain. So I think it's the one is, is, is you're bringing in the governance side of it, which is co-production. So collaboration, it, it feels a bit like incomplete. I like working with you. I, I enjoy working because we, we, we have the same value system, but it's, it, it's an exploration still. Co-production, you have to still come up with what are we producing together, and, and that's the difference. Yeah, um, I think I will be able to maybe respond better to the first, the first, uh, no, was the first or second question, but around um, conflicts of interest. So um, the question of whether or not social scientists and this sort of thinking should be embedded into any one response agency, into any one sector. Um, I can give an example in DRC at the moment. What they've managed to negotiate is that there is a social science data cell which actually sits outside any of the sectors and is independent and is able to input into all of them. Part of that is to be independent. Part of that is just because there's not so many, so they're needed across all of the different sectors, and that's the best way to position them. Um, but it's also a way to get more leverage and more influence in that position. But I think we're still working that out in this space for now. Just a couple of points from me. In terms of the students, reflexivity, it seems to me, is the solution. And actually, given that this, the, the heading of this session is how do we produce robust and relevant evidence, qualitative evidence, to pick up on what Harsha says, if you teach students good reflexive practice, then they will take that forward into their working lives afterwards, and that's essential. And then the second one I would want to just say is pick up again on what you said. Collaborate, for me, co-production is a subset of collaboration. You have to collaborate and then you produce something in your co-production phase. So I, I think that's good. So more questions? There must be more, there is. <laughs> we'll take, t take another pair and then um, see what we make of those two. Good morning. Thank you for the great presentations. Could you talk a little bit about how we can um, bring the discussion about the evidence and the importance of researchers in society, how we should be, like the next steps, because it's important that you talked about the policy making and everything. But like in society, especially here in Brazil, as uh, Professor said before, we are living in a moment very particular, so thank you. Eu vou aproveitar o gancho dela, que era o que exatamente eu estava pensando. É uma questão que eu vejo. É... Colocar. Esperar. You're going to get wired for sound. Aproveitando o gancho, né, eu trabalho com políticas direcionadas a povos indígenas. Uma coisa que a gente vê, é um, que houve na década de 80, fortemente, início dos anos 90, um engajamento muito grande dos acadêmicos e pesquisadores e professores em sociedades agregadas, tipo a Associação Brasileira de Saúde Coletiva, que é a Brasco, a SBPC, né, e que tinham um papel como sociedade civil relevante e, de alguma forma, pelo menos na, na, na área que eu acompanho, né? progressivamente, até com a estruturação maior do setor acadêmico, os incentivos, até dentro da própria pesquisa, gerou uma atuação mais voltada dentro do âmbito acadêmico, que se distanciou. 
Outro ponto que é importante dentro do meu foco de, de trabalho e que é uma queixa muito grande das comunidades indígenas e das lideranças indígenas é realmente a falta de retorno e continuidade de uma relação do pesquisador com a, a sociedade com a qual ele está envolvido nesses projetos. Né? Então, a queixa grande é o pesquisador vai lá, faz sua pesquisa e depois nunca mais retorna e, ao mesmo tempo, não há um retorno direto para os que foram sujeitos e se envolveram dos resultados de pesquisa. Thank you. That's a really important question, and it comes back again to the qualitative research in general. What happens if you engage people for any kind of research or practice, and then they're left abandoned afterwards? So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll respond first to the second question. Um, it's a really good question, and it's something that we think about all the time. We one of the kind of common ways it's referred to in our field is closing the loop, and that's not just extracting information from people, especially in the sorts of contexts that I'm talking about, when people generally have a lot of questions and a lot of confusion, and actually going back and to be able to say, not only to answer the questions, but to say, here is how we use the information. And it's really difficult in this sort of context, you can imagine. Um, often you're working in areas that are hard to reach anyway, um, so to be able to get back to do it, but it's so important. We have, we must have accountability to people that support this sort of work. So what we argue is that it should be embedded into your strategy, your research strategy. How will you go back and feed this information back? Um, in cases where it's not possible, is there a way that we can leverage some of these new technologies that can reach some of these areas to be able to do this? Um, but we're still learning from that, and it's always, yeah, it's always on the agenda. Not just for research, but for community engagement practices in general. Um, one piece of that is around how do we engage local actors in research from the start anyway, which kind of touches upon the first question around um, researchers within society. And if we're going through, you know, if, if local channels are leading this sort of work, then that closing the loop is more, is more natural anyway. Um, and that's one of the models of the sort of social science in emergencies. One approach to it is um, giving the skills to resource people in various communities to be able to collect, use this sort of information and feed it up. Um, so I, I don't know what the right approach is, but that is one that's, that's, that's being kind of thought about and conceptualized. So we'll see how that evolves, that idea of researchers in society. Thank you. Super, thank you. Um, I think just a thought on the researcher and society question which I think is crucially important. Um, and one of the bullet points I couldn't speak to is that I do think in the long term we need to change the way researchers are conceived in society, or what is the role of researchers in society. Um, so I studied in South Africa, and we have colleagues in a country where we have one of the highest inequality rates in the world, and you use public funding to study the implications of Shakespeare on modern day South Africa, and maybe we should translate Shakespeare in a different way. And I really struggle with that. I struggle with that because it's public tax money that could be used to build a school. And it's difficult for me to see how you can justify that that should be the role of research in society. So to me, there is a reframing needed of that research has to make, at least in our context in South Africa, should make a direct contribution to our key core challenges of uh, inequality and poverty. And that is something that I think our research council and our government should be stronger on. Like they should put more I think, um, stick mechanisms in place to ensure that research is relevant to societal problems. So that's, that's my first point. And, but there is a risk to it that we encounter in our work as well. So I think if researchers become activists or advocacy organizations primarily, we might undermine our long-term role engaging with government. Because if we become too associated with particular stances, if there's a change in government, we might have no voice to speak anymore. And so I think it's important to, to preserve this type of, we are in a way providing a technical service to government. And as much as I have a personal opinion as an activist background, in our policy work, we're very careful to try to separate the two. And I think for long term, all of our 
think about research in society, I think there's risk of researchers being too much embedded in activist movements, in particular activist movements that take a very contrarian approach to current administrations, um, because it can undermine the long-term voice that researchers have in a policy context if they're too associated with a particular politi political stance. Okay, I'm not going to. I'm going to come just a minute, but we only have a couple more minutes. I want to just make sure. Is there anything on the virtual platform, Megan? Nothing on the virtual platform. So we'll just get the answer here. We might have time for one more question after that, but that will be it. Okay. I will try to answer the first question, which I think is more related to the Brazilian context, but of course, it's for the world right now. Um, I think that this uh, kind of crisis in trust of science also gives for us, the research community in Brazil, an opportunity to rethink what is our role and how we are communicating for the society what we are doing and what is our relationship with the society. So one practical example of this is the um, a network which we call Collision Science and Society. Uh, which uh, join more than 60 uh, scientists, researchers in Brazil, uh, which works on environment and so social aspects in general. I'm part of this collision. And we are producing many different articles about different issues, most of them related to environmental and social questions and uh, trying to publish these, art these articles in newspapers, in media, in Brazil in general, because we realized that we needed to improve our communication. The second thing is that we think, okay, now just to occupy some uh, important spaces. I think that researchers are very uh, concerned about occupy some spaces and we need to occupy. If you need to, if you like to influence decision making process, if you think to if you like to provoke sign uh, the society to talk about what we are producing, we need to occupy this space. And also the last one, I think that we need more studies about public understanding of science. We need this kind of data to better understand how society is uh, engaging with us, is understanding what we are producing. Okay. Pasha, did you want a quick response to that? You have a long <laughs> she has a long response. So if anybody wants to come and talk to her about those last two questions, please grab Harsha. So yeah, no time for another one. So thank you very much to the panel for the you know excellent engagement. Thank you to you here and you virtually. All everybody here, we're very happy to talk to you if you have a particular question or issue you want to raise with them, I'm sure. So thank you very much.